When I was 13 years old, my greatest wish was to see a hand of glory. I must have been a pragmatic boy, for here was a wish that could come true. For those who don't know, let me explain what a hand of glory is. An occult item, the mummified left hand of a hanged man, specifically a murderer, severed below the wrists at midnight by the light of a full moon. One wonders how easy it would be to fulfil these criteria, but fulfilled they must be for the object to acquire the powers accorded to it. And those powers are impressive. Any candle made from the fat of the dead criminal, combined with virgin wax and sesame oil, placed in the hand and lit, will render all those in its presence, save the bearer, totally unconscious. Nothing will wake them until the flame is doused with milk. Dousing it with water will have no effect. The hand can also unlock any door it comes upon, thus making it of great value to thieves. Those who possess such a potent charm could surely help themselves to the contents of whichever property they fancy. There is another more alarming piece of folklore connected with the fate of the hand's victims. If they are not woken by the second cockcrow of morning, they will die. And not only that, their souls will be taken to hell whether deserving of that fate or not. I say I must have been pragmatic, but there was another worldly drive behind the desire to track down this ghoulish item. It was not purely a matter of having a taste for the macabre. Since the age of five or six, I've been fascinated by the supernatural. How this enthusiasm began, I find it difficult to remember. As difficult to remember as my entry into the world itself, but it's at core to my earliest conscious memories. My parents, and indeed my friends' parents, were aware of this, to judge by the presents I received on birthdays. More often than not, these gifts were anthologies of supernatural stories, mostly fictional, but occasionally collections of supposedly factual accounts too. The titles are still vivid in my mind, as are their covers. Ghosts and Hauntings, Great Ghosts of the World, The Encyclopedia of Witchcraft and Magic, and one of these, perhaps my favourite, was a volume called Haunted Britain, by the delightfully named Anthony D. Hippersley Coax. This took the form of a travel guide with a map at the front, replete with different symbols and accompanied by a complex key, a star for wishing wells, sacred magic and mysterious places, a skull for hauntings, ghosts and poltergeists, a little sea monster for a location identified with the appearance of a spectral and mythical beast, and so on. I would spend hours, my head bent over the map, cross-referencing it with the entries, identifying possible destinations, studying it as if it were some kind of escape route. Although at that age, I had no idea from what I might be trying to escape.